Hey everyone, it's Kenji. I'm gonna make some dumplings. Uh, gyoza, in fact. Japanese gyoza. This is a thing that I have, this is the thing that I've made more than any other thing in my life, probably. Um, I started making gyoza when I was like a toddler, like, you know, four years old or something, maybe younger. Um, you know, my, my mother is Japanese, and what we would do is uh, she would sit me and my two sisters down in front of the TV, you know, in the living room. And then uh, about once every other month or so, maybe once a month, we'd sit there. Uh, she would make the dumpling filling and put out dumpling skins, and we would sit there and make dumplings and then uh, put them in the freezer so that we'd have dumplings for the whole uh, month. Cook them straight from frozen, very convenient. Um, oh, so what I'm doing here, I got equal parts pork, a pound of pork, ground pork, nice and fatty, uh, and ground cabbage. You could also use like ground chicken if you want ground turkey, um, and ground, and, uh, and a pound of cabbage. This is just a green cabbage. Um, usually I use something like Napa cabbage or maybe like a Hong Kong style uh, cabbage, but this is what, green cabbage is what I had in my fridge today, so I'm using that. Might be just shy of a pound, but you want roughly equal parts cabbage and pork for this. Um, now the cabbage, it acts not, not just as a flavoring agent, but really it acts in the same way that say something like breadcrumbs would in a meatball or a meatloaf, you know, it's a, uh, it adds bulk to it, but it also prevents the, um, the interior, the sauce, the uh, dumpling filling from becoming like a, a sausage, you know, we don't want sausages in there. We want nice, tender, juicy filling. All right. So I've just cut it into, you know, roughly chopped it. You can do it by hand like I just did. You can do it in a food processor. Doesn't really matter. What I'm gonna do now is take my cabbage, put it into a bowl. My cabbage has a lot of water in it. You know, like most vegetables, it has a lot of water. That's what makes it so turgid. Um, so I'm gonna take some of that water out. We wanna get rid of it. So I'm gonna take about a teaspoon of kosher salt Sprinkle it over the cabbage, give it some t tosses, and then through the power of uh, osmosis, that salt is gonna draw liquid out from inside those cabbage cells, and the cabbage will go from being uh, tumescent to flaccid. It'll take about 15 minutes, so I'm just gonna set that aside. Meanwhile, I'm gonna start working with my other ingredients. So these are garlic chives, um, you don't need to use these kind of special chives. You know, I just, I use these because I found them at the Chinese market yesterday. You can use regular scallions. You can use regular chives if you'd like, but these are just happen to be garlic chives. A couple ounces of them. I'm gonna, I'm gonna finally chop these. If you were doing scallions, what I would do is I would um, cut them into segments, you know, maybe three or four inch segments, and then split them lengthwise um, a couple times. Uh, and then, line up those lengthwise pieces and slice across them like this so that you get them really sort of finely, finely chopped. I like my scallions to be really finely chopped. Um, sometimes if I'm really feeling very sort of extra special and I really want to put some extra effort into this, I will take my garlic chives or my scallions and I will briefly, very briefly blanch them uh, in salted boiling water, um, which will help them actually lose some of their moisture. Ironically, they lose moisture when you blanch them because you can then squeeze them and the soles collapse. Um, it'll help them lose some of their moisture. It'll give them a slightly milder flavor. Um, it, it's really kind of, you know, it's one of those things that takes a bunch of extra work and really only, uh, you know, incrementally adds to the quality of the finished dumplings. So if you want your dumplings to be like three or 4% better, you can briefly blanch your garlic chives or your scallions, squeeze them out really well, and then add them to your pork. Okay, so this pork, um, I know I had a pound, which is about, uh, 450 grams. To that, I want to add 2% salt, so 9 grams of salt. So for that, I am going to use a scale. But it's about a couple teaspoons of kosher salt, or about a teaspoon of regular salt. Close enough. This is the cabbage, but obviously you're not going to need to add any extra salt to account for the cabbage because the cabbage is already salted. Uh, and then I'm also going to Add white pepper. You can do, you know, any kind of filling you'd like for these dumplings. I'm keeping mine very, I like to keep mine very, very simple. Some people will add, you know, soy sauce. You might add sesame oil. It's not that common in a Japanese dumpling, in a Japanese dumpling, in a gyoza, to add soy sauce or any other flavorings, really. Um, mainly the flavor comes from the meat, salt, white pepper, uh, and uh, whatever vegetable you're adding to it. 
in this case cabbage and chives. Now, if you again, if you wanted to go all out, you could make your own dumpling skins, um, but Japanese dumplings um, are often made with uh, store-bought skins. You can buy these round gyoza wrappers, um, and that's what we always use growing up. That's what my mother used, my grandmother used, uh, and so that's what I use now. Sometimes I will make homemade skins, but usually I'll reserve the homemade skins if I'm making more, you know, Chinese-style dumplings. Okay. Uh, this cabbage is going to sit for about 15 minutes. You will see the liquid come out. In fact, you won't, but you will see the, the cabbage after the liquid has already come out. So I will be back in five minutes or so. You know, I came back. I decided today for funsies, for funzo, I'm going to add a couple other things. So I'll add a little bit of garlic in here. Um, again, not necessary, but I have a ton of garlic in the fridge. And uh, I'm leaving for Christmas break soon, so I want to get through it. All right, garlic. Give it a smack. Smack. You know, my mom, when growing up, in fact, most of the time, we actually had beef dumplings um, because my mom was very frugal. And, um, you know, we lived in uh, Morningside Heights in an, in an area of um, Harlem that um, at the time, you know, in the early 80s, mid 80s, was a sort of meat packing district. You know, so there a lot of butcher shops, um, a lot of meat packing uh, facilities there. Uh, and so sometimes... Um, I'm sure I've told this story before for people who follow the channel, but sometimes what would happen is we'd be, you know, driving and we'd stop at the light at 125th Street and uh, Broadway. And uh, at that light, there was uh, always somebody who would wash your windows, you know, always someone who would want to clean your windows. Uh, and then oftentimes there was a guy who would come by with a cooler of uh, frozen meat that uh, I think I think the guy worked at one of these meat processing plants and would you know steal it out of the loading dock and come and sell it on the street um, and so we would often buy you know steak or ground beef or whatever from the uh, from a guy with a cooler at a stop sign at a stoplight um, and so my mom always had a lot of we had a lot of ground beef in the house growing up that was like the main meat was ground beef um, oh by the way a couple of cloves of garlic I'm gonna slice this ginger. I'm not gonna bother peeling it because this ginger peel is very, very tender. Um, but I am going to smash it. Right, until it's like obliterated and then you can just chop it up. Um, so anyhow, we had a lot of ground beef. Um, my mom would sometimes use it to make things like, you know, spaghetti and meat sauce, um, meatballs, whatever. But uh, very often she would use it for dumpling fillings. Mapo tofu and dumpling fillings. That's where it usually ended up. And those were my two favorite dishes growing up and still my two favorite dishes now. Uh, Mapo tofu traditionally is made with beef. Um, gyoza typically not, but we made them, made, we made them with beef because that's what we had. Now we're going to need another couple minutes. So I will be back in a few minutes later. All right. So it's been about 15 minutes total. Um, by the way, last thing I'm adding to this <laughs> dumpling filling, I apologize for doing this in steps, a little bit of sugar. Um, all right, so the dumpling filling, just as a reminder, a pound of pork, a couple of ounces of chives or scallions, a couple of, so far in here, a couple of garlic cloves, about a teaspoon of minced ginger, uh, about uh, nine grams of salt, um, a little bit less. Nine grams of salt is going to be pretty salty, um, so you can do less than that if you want. You know, you can do something more like six grams if you like sort of only a moderate salt level. Uh, and then finally, about a half teaspoon of ground white pepper, uh, as well as a teaspoon of sugar. Over here, I've got another pound of cabbage that I've seasoned uh, with about six grams of salt. Okay, and so that salt is going to draw out the liquid. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to squeeze it. So there, there's a couple of ways you can go about squeezing <clears throat> your cabbage. One way is to get a clean kitchen towel, you know, lay it out, put your cabbage in the middle, twist the towel. Um, that works. Uh, it's also pretty rough on your towels. So, um, you know, I've, I've torn kitchen towels doing that before uh, and they don't come out very clean at the end. Um, so what, I've, what I'm doing today, instead I'm taking a potato ricer. I'm going to put my cabbage in it. And once again, with the power of physics, in this one, in this case, what is it? A class two lever, I think. Um, I'm gonna squeeze out all that excess. Okay. Is that a class two lever? Class one is a seesaw, right? I think this is a class two where the uh, the fulcrum is at one end, the the work is on one end, and the and the load is in the middle. The idea is we, we really want to concentrate the flavor. We don't want to introduce too much extra water in here. So we're squeezing out as much moisture as possible. Yeah, 
If you ever want this written recipe, by the way, or at least a uh, a version of this, you know, I never follow exact recipes on this on the YouTube channel. But if you want a actual written, tested, cross-tested, published version of this recipe, um, you can find it for free on Serious Eats. I always encourage people to do free stuff if they can't afford to support me in other ways. Um, you can find it for free on Serious Eats. You can just follow along in the video, um, or you can find it in uh, my book, The Walk, which also has lots of other recipes that are well worth, at least according to the reviews on Amazon, everything is well worth the price of admission in this book. All right, that's my plug for the day. Okay, so now we're gonna go in here with our hands and we really wanna kinda knead it all together. Do you need to knead it? Uh, yes, you do need to. Um, it, we're doing more than sort of just sort of thoroughly combining here. You know, the idea is not just to evenly distribute the um, pork and the cabbage and, and all the seasoning and stuff, that's part of it. But really, um, we also want to uh, make sure that the, the proteins in the pork um, start to become sticky. You know, the, the more you buy, the more you, the, the more you work at it like this, the more mechanical action you take on them. Um, the, the proteins, which are sort of like, you know, tangled up little balls of yarn, as you knead them like this, they start to detangle um, and start to cross link with each other. And that's what's gonna make sure that the filling is cohesive. Now, if you did this without all the uh, filler, you know, without all the cabbage and the other vegetables and stuff, um, you would end up with something like sausage. You know, sausage uh, is mainly meat and fat, some seasonings, but usually doesn't have a lot of what are called inclusions, you know, other vegetable matter, things like that. Um, and so sausages end up actually very, very sticky because the proteins really tightly bind together. And so that's why a sausage um, has that sort of springy, bouncy texture to it. Um, it's all through the action of meat and salt. In fact, even the name for sausage comes from the word for salt. You can't make a sausage without the salt. At least not a good one. All right, there's our dumpling filling. I'm gonna transfer it to a smaller bowl. In fact, I'll just use this bowl. All right, so at this stage, we're gonna start making the actual dumplings themselves. Uh, and to do that, we're gonna take our skins. So. If you work fast, you don't really have to do much with the skins. If you don't work too fast, what you want to do is have your skins, um, make sure that they're completely covered all the time. So either with a piece of plastic wrap um, or with this original packaging, just upside down like that. Um, but if you work pretty fast, you can just leave them unstacked. Um, I know I work pretty fast, so I'm going to leave them. So I'm going to show you first sort of the real, um, the, the way I would, do, the way I typically do it. Um, so add a little bit of water around the outside of the rim like that. I'm going to add smear of the uh, the filling, okay? And then, starting with this end, I'm gonna give it a little pinch, and I'm trying to do seven pleats here, okay? So I do, I'm pleating only one side, so only this side of the rim uh, of the fill, of the wrapper is gonna be pleated, whereas this side's gonna remain flat. So I pinch it there, here's one, two, three, four, five. If it's a little too full, you can pull some out, six. And then finally, seven. Okay, so one side is pleated, the other side is smooth. And what that does is it forces it into this kind of crescent shape, so then when you put it down, you can kind of plump it up like this, you see? And then give it a nice little squeeze. And there you end up with a perfectly pretty gyoza. I don't know why seven pleats, um, that's just what I was always taught when I was a kid, make seven pleats. You know, um, and so I do it, but uh, I don't know. It's probably because like when you make seven pleats, you end up with eight sections, and you know, eight is a uh, is a lucky number. Maybe that's what it is. I'm completely speculating there, but smear of filling. That's probably too much filling. Even I overstuff sometimes. Water. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Nope, oh, I didn't overstuff. Perfect. 
dumplings, you know, it, it, the tendency is to overstuff in the same way that like the tendency is to overstuff burritos, you know, um, and when they're overstuffed, especially if you haven't done this a ton, um, it's difficult to make those pleats. Um, and so you end up with not even being able to put in as much filling. Um, so start with start with a minimal amount of filling and work up from there. All right. If you want to make them a, a slightly simpler way, here's what you do. Okay. You do the same thing. Get the edges wet. Okay. Now, instead of starting at one side, just fold it in half, just like that, right? Pinch it right in the middle, right? And then working from each side, do one pleat just like that. And then another pleat, one pleat, and then another pleat. You'll find that is a much easier way to do it. Um, the dumplings don't end up looking the way I expect a dumpling to look, but that is perfectly fine. That is a perfectly serviceable dumpling. In fact, I think it's a pretty dumpling. If you want to make it even simpler, of course, you can always just do something like this. Boop, just the way you'd make a, I don't know, a pierogi. Just like that, fold it in half, all right? And if you want to make that a little bit prettier, or if you say you're going to put it into like a soup or something, you're going to boil it or steam it, um, and you're not going to bother frying it, the other way you can make that prettier is start by um, putting a little, start with the shape, put a little bit of water there, and then pull these ends together and pinch them there. And you got essentially what you've got like a, like a capellini, you know, or what they would call a water caltrop shape. Um, that's that. All right. Um, and if you don't want to do any, any of those things, you can do like what my daughter does, which is just randomly fold the, fold the dough into various shapes with some amount of filling or sometimes no filling at all. Um, and uh, yeah, the, you know, no matter how you do it, it's going to come out delicious. Um, I'm going to finish making these dumplings. You'll see I'm putting them on this, um, uh, on this tray right here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to line up this whole tray with dumplings and then I will throw the whole thing into the freezer uh, and leave it there for a couple hours. And then tonight I'll come pick up the dumplings, put them into a bag and they will be ready to go. You know, they'll be good in the freezer for about a month and you can cook them directly from frozen. The brand, you know, there, there is some variance in the brand, but generally you're stuck with what you can find at the supermarket. Um, so, you know, just go with whatever, go, go with whatever you can find. Uh, and, uh, It'll work. I've never found a brand that doesn't, you know, that literally doesn't work. Some are thicker than others. Um, and, and honestly, I don't, I don't necessarily have a preference for, um, whether I prefer like super thin dumplings or kind of thicker, chewier dumplings. Um, I'd like them both. So honestly, I've never found a brand of dumpling skins that, uh, I dislike. So, um, it doesn't matter too much. At least for me. All right. So to cook these dumplings, non-stick skillet, you can use carbon steel if you've got a really nice, well-seasoned carbon steel pan. Um, but I, I like to use non-stick just because it's completely foolproof. Non-stick skillet, reasonable amount of oil, enough to coat the bottom. Okay, we are going to fry, we're doing this in what's called the pot sticker style. So um, the bottoms are going to be fried, uh, the tops are going to be steamed, and so you get that combination of textures, hard and soft, crispy and tender. If I was using carbon steel, I would let it preheat a little bit, but in a nonstick pan, you can throw them right in even when the uh, pan is heating up. Um, and as I mentioned, you can absolutely do these straight from frozen uh, if you'd like. And you can also feel free to crowd the pan. I'm not because I'm only making six, uh, but you can, as long as uh, the dumplings are touching the bottom of the pan, uh, you can put as many as you like in there. It's not going to, it's not going to ruin them to try and cook too many at a time. I'll make a couple more of these while, uh, while I wait for that. Um, I think I have another video on the channel already where I show you how to um, cook these dumplings. Maybe I even showed you how to make the dumplings. I probably have an older video showing you how to make dumplings. Um, and I know I definitely have a recipe or a video somewhere that shows you how to make uh, dumplings with the fr crispy fried wings. You know, essentially what you do is as you're frying them, um, well, once they start to fry, you pour in a slurry of uh, either cornstarch or a mixture of cornstarch or maybe tapioca starch or wheat starch. Um, and flour uh, and water. Uh, you pour that in there and then uh, as the water evaporates it leaves behind this kind of layer of starch on the bottom that ties all the dumplings together and fries up nice and crispy. Um, I call them dump wings. Um, they're, um, in Japanese they're called, um, you know, they, they are literally, they're literally called dumplings with wings in Japanese. So, uh, Hanetsuki gyoza. Is that right? I think so. 
All right, let's see how this browning is going. All right, so nice and brown. Looking good. All right, so at this point, what we're gonna do is we're going to add some water to there. Enough water to come up about you know, a quarter inch or so. We'll cover it up, we'll turn the heat up. And now what's gonna happen is that water is obviously evaporating, bubbling, uh, and as the water evaporates, it's going to steam around there, it's going to cook the dumplings, and then eventually all that water is going to evaporate away, leaving just the dumplings and the oil once again, and at that point we will re-crisp it. That's gonna take probably four to five minutes, um, so I will come back in. Three or four minutes, all right? So I can hear from the sound of it uh, that most of the water has evaporated. It's starting to crackle and sizzle now, um, so I'm gonna take the lid off. In fact, yes, the water has all evaporated. So at this point, give it a little shake, Make sure the dumplings are separated from the bottom. And what I'm looking for now, so the dumplings are all the way cooked through, and so all I'm looking for now is to make sure that the bottoms are crispy again, which they are almost there. You know, I'm gonna go get a little, a little dipper. I'm gonna do these, um, for dipping, I'm gonna do a little combination um, of soy sauce and rice vinegar, which is the way, uh, which is the way we did it growing up. Um, although you know you can use something like Chinese black vinegar just on its own. Oops, a little bit more soy sauce than I wanted, but that's all right. I would do generally do about 50/50 soy sauce rice vinegar. Um, that's the way we did it at home. Uh, you don't have to do it that way, of course. All right, let's take a look at how crispy these are. Woo, look at that, beautiful. You see that? All right, let's shut that off. Go plate it up. I like to plate these up with the pleats, the pleats and the uh, the crispy bits facing up and kind of nestled into each other. That way, the crispy bits stay crispy. The pretty side, the pretty side, shows. And everybody's happy. Woo, that got really inflated, huh? Got a little balloon. They they will look bigger when they're in the pan, obviously, because they're hot. Uh, and then as they cool down a little bit, they're going to lose some of their volume because uh, that air uh, is going to lose volume as it cools down. <laughs> All right, I ate a bunch of these and I accidentally shut off the camera. Um, so I'll eat some more uh, and give the same commentary. All right, um, you can see how crispy these are, right? Crispy bottoms, tender tops. I'm gonna give it a little dip in the uh, mixture here. Hmm. Filling is uh, springy, uh, juicy, and tender. Mm. Plenty of good flavor from that uh, cabbage and chives. I am double dipping, and I'm aware. Man, yeah. Dumplings are so good. There's a reason these are my favorite food. Right, Hamon? All right, bud. You can have the last bite. <laughs> All right. Japanese gyoza, very simple, very delicious. Guys, gals, non-binary pals, I will see you next time. I think I'm just farted. <laughs>